Welcome to the Saturday morning wake-up call right here on KFAR. This is hour one, technically, of Patriot's Lament, which is a project which was conceived in the minds and hearts of the Bennett brothers, Aaron Bennett from Far North Tactical, and Josh Bennett from Bighorn Enterprises. Joining us this morning all the way from Bighorn. Just got back from a little trip up north. Yeehaw! We got Josh Bennett up in here today. How are you feeling today, brother? You're looking Good. a little... Uh, I'm a little tired. A little on the tired side, a little peaked. You can just grab some more coffee. Uh, it was pretty sweet. I got to listen to 20 hours of... About 20 hours between Hans Hopp and Tom Woods' uh, lectures in the last couple of days. <laughs> My brain was fried when I got back. No more. No, some more. <laughs> the brain is like a sponge. You can only hold so much before you have to squeeze it out and drip it on somebody. Well, that's when I, I squeeze it out here, and then I go get some more. I was, uh, one of the things that I was listening to Mr. Tom Woods, he was explaining what a state was, and the, uh, how basically a state is a jurisdiction, it's a body, an organization, it's nothing. That claims jurisdiction over a certain area, you know, we all know that, supposedly. And it's also a body that claims the right to legislate, create law. And it also claims the right to tax at will, any tax that it feels like coming up with. And, which is all fine and good, it's not, but... And then the crux of it all is that it also is the ultimate arbitrator. It claims to be the ultimate arbitrator between all um, judicial acts. So any claim against one citizen against the other, it says, well, we're the arbitrator. We're a final arbitrator. But it also claims to be the final arbitrator against its own self. So if someone has a grievance with the state, it says, okay, well, come on in here. We'll have a listen to what you got to say sometimes. But we will decide whether or not we are correct in what we're doing. And his whole point was to show how, basically show the fallacy of the so-called people that wish for limited constitutional government. We have, uh, when the founders, founders is kind of a funny thing. You know, when we say founders, most people think of people that, wrote the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, such, First Continental Congress, and we leave out an important important part of those people, which is the different colonists, you know, 20 years before. You know, all of them were part of the founding of this country, the uh, different cultures that they had. We, it's funny that, uh, you know, today we have, we say our diversity is our strength. And John Jay said that it was our, um, the likenesses that we had, the different things that were the same about us that was our strength. So anyways, one of the things that the the colonists said about Parliament, and I'll make this make sense someday, sometime in this hour. One of the things the colonists said about Parliament was, <clears throat> you guys are breaking the Constitution. Now we have to remember that the English Constitution was not a written document. It was a document that was um, well it wasn't a document it was just something that was from culture precedent but mostly it was from culture that uh, and from down the years you know the Magna Carta was part of their constitution that was part of their culture law was part of their culture so they said well you guys are breaking the constitution the parliament said well how do you figure they said well these laws that you're enacting against us, we, you know, it's common knowledge that one can't be taxed without his consent. No taxation without representation. And Parliament at the time said, well, that may be so, but since we're Parliament, anything that we make up and or do is constitutional. Colonists had a problem with that. But if we look at today... It's kind of interesting when um, the FBI was and a federal prosecutor was on Mr. Duke's show here a couple months back. I think some people listened to that one. The, uh, one of the things that that prosecutor said, well, someone asked, well, what if it's an unconstitutional law that they pass? Well, Congress passes. 
And he claimed, well, if Congress passes it, then it's constitutional. Which brings us about the fallacy again of having limited government. Because we have a body that ha- that says and claims whatever we decide is constitutional, it's constitutional. And if you dispute that claim, well, we'll go to court. And our judge that we pay, who's actually part of the same team here, will decide whether or not what we did was correct or incorrect. To put it into a sport analogy, if I may, if I can just jump in for a second, because this is one of the things that I I can really get to my mom with is is through sports, because she's a a big NBA fan. She's a big fan. That's exactly. Tom Wood uses the same analogy as basketball. To put it into an NBA kind of a, a point of view, basically what you're saying is, is that you've got people who are on the team. For instance, if the Phoenix Suns go to play the San Antonio Spurs, they show up. And they've got members of the Spurs not only out on the court, but they've also got Spurs wearing the referee outfit. So the refs on the the refs on the field are also members of the San Antonio Spurs. And then if they if they've got a problem with the NBA with with the refs on the field, they appeal to the commissioners who also happen to be the sole owners of the San Antonio Spurs, and also happen to be paid by the Spurs. So basically. If I could make that analogy, yeah. I don't know if that holds up. No, it's the same. But analogy. basically, what what recourse would the Phoenix Suns have? They're going, they're showing up on the Spurs court to play by the Spurs rule in the Spurs house, and basically, whatever the Spurs, the Spurs are going to win. Yeah. Every game. To take it even further, the uh, let's say they're playing the Suns. That is the the Suns. Phoenix Suns is what I said. The Suns. Oh, did you say Suns? Well, that's probably why it popped in my brain. So, so they're playing the Suns. Well, the Phoenix Suns also have to come in the game and provide the Spurs their uniforms and their refreshments in between the game or whatever, you know, they got to buy the Gatorade for them. They have to show up with the ball because the um, Spurs don't produce anything. So the Phoenix Suns have to go out and they have to produce to buy a ball. They have to produce to buy the uh, the uh, uniforms, the shoes, you know, they got to have Air Jordans. Those babies cost a lot of money if you get the good ones. You don't want to go out there with just regular old Nikes. So, and at the same time, you know, the Spurs are saying, look, you need to buy all this stuff for us, but in order, when you do that, we're going to give you a secure area to play the game, and it's going to be fair, and blah, blah, blah. But it's the same thing that we have happened to us. So the Suns show up, they give them everything, they give them the ball, and then the guy goes, yeah, it's my ball now. I get to decide how the ball's played. I get to decide how the game's played. And the Suns say, well, well, what? Well, wait a minute. Here's the rule book right here. It says that you're limited to blah, blah, blah. Well, let's ask our, let's ask the ref. But but here's the, here's the really crazy part is that the rule book gets changed whenever the Spurs want to change it. Yeah. And there's a process that's supposed to be followed. Sure, they can in order, amend in order, the in order for the rule book to be changed. But the bottom line is is that there are also people that sit on the sidelines and write additional regulations for the rule book <laughs> which are have equal equal weight of law right to, to what's going on. So, I mean they and that is not not what we deal with. Absolutely. We're playing Calvin ball, buddy. We don't know who's <laughs> we don't know what the rules are until we're midway through the game and Calvin guess what? Always wins. You lose. <laughs> But the analogy is exactly correct. And, you know, we have this huge state. I mean, it's it's massive. And, you know, one of the things that they tell us is that, well, we are here to protect you. What's one of the things that they protect? They protect us from evil business. Those greedy, dirty rat businessmen. If it wasn't for us, you guys would still be out there crawling in the dirt looking for worms to eat. Working 120, 180 hours a week for three pennies. But luckily, you know, while they're walking around in their white mustaches and big bags of money on their back with the dollar signs on them. But because of us, we've made sure that they've shared some of that wealth. And yet, they fail to show that they're actually the parasites that are doing absolutely nothing. And they walk around with the big bags of money on their back. I mean, how good is it to be in government? Just how good is it to be even the most lowly of the lowlies in government? 
You get pensions and benefits and retirements, and you can't be fired by any means possible ever. It's a great job. And yet, but they're there to protect us. Our great wise overlords is what uh, Tom Woods would call them, our great wise overlords. And that's exactly what they are. They are our overlords. And we falsely think that, well, we can get them back under this Constitution. But yet, if that was so, then they wouldn't be able to be where they are right now. When you had, in the 1943, I think it was, Franklin Delano Roosevelt decided arbitrarily that... hmm, Anything over, anyone that makes over $25,000, the tax rate after $25,000 is 100%. This was during a war. Now, Congress came, finally stood up and said, uh, probably not a good idea. They didn't knock the idea down based on, hey, Roosevelt, where in Article 1, Section 8, or any of these articles do you have the authority to arbitrarily do this? They didn't say that at all. They said it's probably not a good idea because we're in a war and we need a high rate of production and if people can't profit off of the war and they say, hey, anything over 25000 bucks, I'm not going to make anything. So production is going to go down. We won't get the war production that we need. We're going to lose the war. So Franklin Delano decided, well, that's probably a good idea. So we won't do that right now. Okay, but... Did he have jurisdiction to do that? No. In, in the Constitution, you can pull it out and say, Ugh. no, there was no jurisdiction. But he did it anyway. When uh, Franklin had the Supreme Court, they had rules about, because they were in the Great Depression, they had rules for farmers. Okay, People were starving in the Great Depression. They were eating whatever they could get their hands on. I, my grandpa has told me about um, eating crows. He lived in Oklahoma. There was nothing there. He said one time they actually killed a crow and they ate it and they were so happy because they had something to eat. So to pull them out of this depression, what does Franklin Delano Roosevelt want to do with all these poor people? Well, he decides, well, one of the great things we can do here is to help the farmers make more money. So the best way to help farmers would be to create a scarcity of goods, which would make prices go up, which would make them more money. Not to mention the fact that the consumers themselves were broke and didn't have any money to buy items in the first place. So the United States government killed, slaughtered 6 million pigs to make pork a scarce item, thus to drive up the prices. It didn't work. Actually, people couldn't afford to buy the pork anyways. You had 6 million dead pigs. They didn't, I mean, these pigs didn't go to market. They didn't feed the starving people. That was one of their fixes. The other one of their fixes was to disc under 10 million acres of cotton to drive up cotton prices for the farmers. Then the farmers will make more money. Well, what about the guy that's got rags on that can't afford the higher prices? Too bad for him. But the main point is, where did they have the jurisdiction to do such things? Well, they didn't, but they do it anyway. They create law. They do the same things that the founding fathers, the the colonists said about the parliament. You may not do this. And they said, yes, if we say it's correct, then it is correct. When um, one of the things during World War II is that you could only grow so much food for yourself. Now, you would think when you have a scarcity and people don't have jobs and people are starving, you would want the highest means of production possible. But no, Roosevelt, in his brilliant mind, decided that scarcity would make everything better. And I can't remember exactly the um, the court case or the guy's name, but there was one farmer who grew 40 acres of wheat on his own land. He, The feds came to him and said, you, you, this is way over your quota, buddy. What are you doing? He said, well, this is what I use. So they drug him into court and ended up going to the Supreme Court of the United States and he's, his whole thing was, you don't have jurisdiction to tell me what I can grow on my own land. And they said, well, well sure we do, because of the Commerce Clause. He said, no, no, no. I have 40, it might have been 25 acres. 25, it doesn't matter. He said, no, this is on my own land in a single county, in a single town, 
this weed is going to be for my family and my consumption. It's not going across any, not even a county line, much less a state border for interstate commerce. And so the way the court came back was, well, if you hadn't grown that wheat, you would have had to have bought it from someone else. Chances are the wheat that you bought to feed your family would have came across state lines. Thus, in your inaction, you've given us jurisdiction over your actions. So because he grew his own wheat and didn't have to buy it over the state lines, the court said, your inactions, the fact that you did nothing, you could have or might have, if you needed to, have done this, so we're going to nail you for it. So that's the that's the ultimate of the state. That's where we get our they get to arbitrarily decide what is right and wrong. That's what comes up when you have a government that says you have a president that says he can arbitrarily pass or even ask Congress to pass firearms laws. Well, we know for a fact that in the Second Amendment guarantees the right that we already had as humans to protect ourselves. And they say no. Well. If we decide that you may not anymore, Thomas Jefferson said that the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution was the cornerstone of the whole Constitution. It was the cornerstone of the whole deal. Without it, without the states being able to tell the federal government to fly off a cliff, then there was no use of having it. And yet, today I was listening to a lecture with Kevin Gunsman, who's uh, he has a PhD in history and uh, Wow. And also, he's a lawyer. He said in the bar exam, they do a pre-exam or whatever, where the professors help go through all these different questions. And one of the things they told him was, you'll find that in some of the multiple answer questions, the Tenth Amendment will be one of the answers. And he said, just a heads up, that's never the right answer. So our lawyers today, even they're taught this Tenth Amendment means nothing. Nothing means anything. We have an arbitrary government that says it has jurisdiction over everything. And, you know, people say, well, you know, court case this, a court case that. They don't have jurisdiction about... Well, yeah, they do, buddy. Because what they have that you don't have a choice over is a big gun. And when they say that we have jurisdiction over such and such and such, and you say, no, you don't, they rock a shell in and say, oh, yeah, I do. Point, point of order, if I may, sir. You, point of order? Uh, you, you mentioned... Uh, the Second Amendment guarantees our right to keep and bear arms. Um, guarantees uh, the right that we already have. I, I just the 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 point is the, the border is this. At what point in history has a piece of paper ever guaranteed anything? Correct. Which, yeah, we're getting to that whole thing with the Constitution. See, uh, you met, you mentioned earlier also this issue of uh, a man's property not being able to do on his own property what he wanted to do. I mean, doesn't that really fly at the whole root of the issue of what we're dealing with in the, the locally in the Fairbanks area? The right to do with your property, and we've been barking about this since day one, actually, from when we first actually were invited on your show, was regu- regulatory laws and property rights. Without property rights, you have no freedom. The basis of liberty is property you can't do with what you want with your own property doesn't matter what your neighbor thinks you ought to be able to do and that's the great fallacy today is wow if if i don't think that you should be doing that that hurts my feelings and then it makes my property not as valuable so you know, that's tough luck if you don't like what your neighbor's doing you may have to move yourself not well he needs to move no you need to move you don't like what your neighbor's doing with his own stinking property that he has the absolute jurisdiction and right over, or should have. <laughs> We've talked about this over and over with um, James Madison. You know, a rightful government doesn't. It is nothing but protect property. John Locke. The only reason we come into society is for government to protect property. We've discussed why that doesn't work, because the government has to steal your property and protect it. But. If they won't protect our property, if it comes under arbitrary laws and regulations, is what zoning laws and all that is. It's all arbitrary crap where they can change their mind at any moment that they want to. Then you don't have liberty. You don't have freedom. They're illegitimate. And according to the classical liberal theory, 
we don't have any any uh, duty to obey or listen to such persons. But what about people who say, well, that I can get grandfathered in? And they can do whatever they want to. I'll be grandfathered in. Yeah, because I want that same law to protect me that it protect the slaves, the grandfather clause. Yeah, if you want the grandfather clause to be your arbitrator, that's great. Admit that you're a slave. Well, but what if they change the law to the point where even if something that should have been grand, so-called grandfathered is now illegal? There's that, that issue in Missouri right now. Well, yeah, well, that's the whole point. They can do whatever they want. There's no, the Constitution is worthless. And to fight the Constitution and say, we need to get back, is a worthless waste of time. Okay, I will, I will back up a little bit. If you're arguing with Barack Obama... Or if you're arguing with Tammy Wilson or you're arguing with any legislator or such, absolutely shove the Constitution in their face and use it against them. Absolutely. Okay? Because they're breaking it. And if you can proficiently, sufficiently show your point, especially if people are around, that's a great thing to do. Use it. Use every weapon that you have. Mm, minus careful, violence. Careful. <laughs> Use every means that you have to disprove the other side. Absolutely. Use the Constitution against them. We can do that all day long. But to say that you need to go back to the Constitution is false. We need something better. Well, which is nothing. And I, I don't, I don't mean to be argumentative. With I'll you, bring it on. But I, I need to. I mean, how do you argue something with somebody who doesn't believe it's true? I mean, you're talking about bringing them back to the Constitution. That that'd be like right. saying, you know, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to argue the finer points of the Koran yeah, with, that, the, with that, a Baptist. How does that make any difference? Somebody could believe that we should own slaves, but just because somebody, one guy's saying we should and the other guy's saying we shouldn't doesn't it's the argument mean of that public. we're going to start doing slavery again for special people. And it's the argument of the public arena, isn't it, Aaron? I mean, that's what we say on and on. It was, it's the hearts and minds. It's, it doesn't matter if you convince... Because you won't. Hillary Clinton. Well, you know what? Hillary Clinton knows she's wrong. She's not stupid. She's probably actually a brilliant woman. <laughs> but she's an idiot. But <laughs> she knows that what she's doing is wrong. They know that these things are unconstitutional, but they don't want to be bothered with such things. The only guy that ever stood up, Ron Paul, and said, where do you find this? In Article 1, Section 8. And they go, well, It's sit pretty down. simple. The Constitution limits power. Who would want anything to do with that? Exactly. But I think I think Josh is really hitting at the core of the issue. Without pro without property, without the respecting of property, there is no liberty. You can you can um, go back and look at the erosion of our liberties, and it correlates directly with the erosion of uh, individual property rights. And it goes, property is so much more than what we're taught. Um, I wasn't taught in school, but anyways, what people are taught in school is property is this piece of land that you go get a mortgage for, and you have this little title down at the title company, and you pay the bank for 30 years, and you pay the borough for the rest of your freaking life, whatever they arbitrarily decide <laughs> that your property is worth, blah, blah, blah. That's Okay, that is one form of property, but property is self-ownership, right? You own yourself. Now, and some of you Christians, you get all bent out of shape. You say, wow, no, we don't own ourselves. God owns us. Okay, I'll give you that. God owns you, right? That's great. I'm, I'm good with that. What I'm saying is, as far as another man, you own yourself. Another man does not own you, nor should he own you, nor should you think that he should own you. Nor should you think that you own somebody else. Exactly. So, in his, in his in of itself, you own your own body. No one should tell you what to do with it. Now, how you treat it as far as God owning you, that's between you and him, not between your neighbor deciding to throw you in jail to make God happy. <laughs> now, I know we can get into the church thing and all that, but I don't want to. So, property. Anything that you own is your personal property, your body, whatever you appropriated, appropriate for yourself, it's your own works, it's your own money. And if it's not safe from arbitrary rule, you're not free. 
We'll be back in just a moment with more of the Saturday morning wake up call. All right, maybe maybe that point is worth and maybe that point is worth making here as we are uh, going through the break here. We always have the greatest conversations. Josh the break. and I are talking because we much, get to say what we really think. You know, and people who talk about how you know well, they're trying to define property simply by you know specifics of physical value. Really, anything that you get in return for your life is property. I mean, if you go out and you spend eight hours working baling hay, or or if you spend eight hours writing a paper, or you spend whatever, and whatever you get on the other side of that of value, whether it's monetary or, you know, silver, somebody says, hey, I'm going to give you a side of moose if you come out and help me you know, gut this monster that I just got down. Anything at that point that you have traded your hours, your life, for is your, perp- your personal property. Right, and the state says that that's an income above and beyond, you know, like some, you got this excess for some reason. But and if, yet it, you toiled. Exactly, and if they come and they take away the fruit of your labor, it's as if they had enslaved you or forced you to work for their benefit for however long it took to take what they're taking from you. Yeah, it's so funny that, um, you know, Jefferson actually mocked that. And they... When you you have to understand a time and the way that they wrote and how so many of the things that the founding fathers wrote they were mocking. It's like if you heard them talk, they'd be if they're actually speaking, they would be when they're saying some of these quotes that we give and stuff. They'd be at the end, they'd be going, ha, 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 oh, and then the whole house would be like, oh, oh you just, uh, huh, you're so funny. Like when Adams Samuel Adams said. What's this? They get to tax our lands next? And the whole House of Commons, you know, went in an uproar. Oh, right. Sam, sit down. You've been tugging on that legger too much, man. <laughs> you need to cool it. They're going to tax our property. And um, Jefferson mocked the, the thought of taxing one's labor. He thought that was hilarious. Right. You're going to. What kind of government would dare tax someone's labor? And uh, I think last week we read from uh, something, I think it was John Jay said about property. He was talking about the right to private property and the, uh, I mean, no, he was Madison, but one of, basically he was saying, oh, right, like that would happen. You know, those are the kind of things that Turkey does and, and those Muslim nations, that's how they treat property. Never would it happen over here in a civilized peoples. And yet, when you trade your labor for anything anything monetary you know they don't want you to barter that's like against the law when you trade that they're saying that you have gained something for nothing even though so what they're saying when they say that they literally are saying that they own your own body because you should own your own body you have the you do own your own body so when you trade your labor your sweat whatever your time your time is yours and it's valuable whatever you trade it for should be yours it's not an excess income and yet, they certainly think it is. And they live high on the hog during, I mean, for that. Look at, if anything, if people, I just, I want people to be so sick of the state that they just want it to be gone. And yet, nonstop, people come in and defend reasons why we need to have it. Who's going to build the roads, Josh? Who's going to, you know. Find me an Article 1, Section 8, where Congress has the right to build roads, people. You constitutional small government people, you conservatives, you find me where the Constitution authorizes the federal government to build roads. Show me where the Constitution authorizes the federal government to build railroads. Show me where it authorizes the the Congress to bail out banks. Show me where it authorizes them to create a federal reserve. Show me where it authorizes them to have an EPA. Didn't they change the Constitution about 100 years ago specifically in order to do all of those things that you just talked about? No. Well, how did we get the Federal Reserve? They said that they were going to do it anyways. That's basically what it's come down to. They have a structure that they were supposed to follow called the amendment process. But that takes too much time. And some of the amendments they tried to pass... Eh, didn't work out very good. You know, some people look at the 14th Amendment and say, yeah, well, under the 14th Amendment, that keeps... Well, actually, the 14th Amendment was never ratified because the northern the northern states, after the Civil War, the War of Southern Dependence, as it should be correctly stated, 
they passed the 14th Amendment and did not allow the southern states to vote, even though they wouldn't allow the southern states to leave the union and said, no, you are part of this union. Now we're going to force a law on you. Now we're going to force the 14th Amendment on you. Well, we didn't get to vote for the 14th and 13th and 14th Amendment. Well, <laughs> too bad. Oh, they shoved that through without having the proper ratification. So we can see from the 1860s and 70s on, this document is garbage because the people that are in control are garbage. Legislators are garbage. Why do they want to be in there in the first place? What gives you the desire to be a legislator? Is it to protect your fellow man? Because you get to covet your covet everybody else's everything without having to feel guilty. And you get to expropriate every and anything that you feel like expropriating. And you get to be like the Puritans and get to demand how people live their lives. Which, I mean, we're so far gone. And we don't believe it's a hopeless matter. What Our whole goal is that when it finally collapses, which it's a coming, the train's chugging down the track and there's no more rail. When that sucker falls off, we wish that people that think the way we do will be in the position to not have power, but to convince people through conversation and argumentation that we don't want to go back to what we had. And we don't want to go back to something even worse. We don't want to dictate what we need to do, if anything, is go into small communities and rule ourselves. And we talked about that last week or two weeks ago where John Jay That doesn't was, sound very, like very much fun, Josh. Well, it's not as much fun for people that have power right now, but it's pretty sweet for the guy that's getting beat down and 50% of his property stolen and from yet, him every And yet, how many year. people do you hear all the time? I mean, we, mostly the conservative types that say that the really the first things that we're going to need to do when the society collapses is to create a new society. We're going to have find to, new lead, better we're leaders. Have to find a better leader. There's nothing wrong with uh, a quote unquote leadership. Like you know, we could hopefully let's just say everything craps here. Hopefully there'd be some wise men that we could look to and they'd say, hey, you know, we don't need to freak out. Let's make a little plan here. Blah blah blah. Where it turns crappy is when they decide, and we're going to start uh, writing laws and shooting you in the head if you don't obey them and throwing you in jail and blah, blah, blah. Let's make a new government. Let's make a new. Yeah, but we'll next time we need to make it a limited government, though. Right. As and long we'll, as we limit the government, that'll be just fine. We'll but put it on a PDF, We could too, put constitutional constraints on it. Yeah. We will, we will write down, we will amend the Constitution that we create so that they know that they cannot do certain things. That will keep them in line. They know that they cannot now, but they do. They may not, but they sure can. Because they have the force of arms. That's the only way they're getting away with this stuff. It started in the Civil War. When the states said, you know, when we signed up for this, this is like, let's just use Virginia for one example. You know, when we signed on to this Constitution, we told you all that uh, if we decided we didn't like the way it was going anymore, we're out. It's right here. We wrote it down. We gave it to you. You guys accepted that. They're talking to the national government. You accepted that we could secede at any time that we wished to. And you guys accepted and said, well, of course. This is a voluntary association. Anyone can join. Well, not anyone can join. But... Anyone that does join right now, well, surely they can just leave at any time. And if we're incorrect in following the Constitution, why any state can nullify it and just say, no, that's incorrect. Because, you know, you guys are the ones ratifying the Constitution. So you are the ultimate arbitrators for the Constitution. So they reminded him of that. And then uh, Lincoln said, want to bet? Kill him. And 800,000 people later, we found out who was correct. Who is correct? I'm on the edge of my seat. Really? Very. I'd be careful on that seat. <laughs> 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 Nothing but the finest used Eastern German Union. The federal German government Eastern. is correct. It is the ultimate arbitrator over everything now. It is a central. It's not a cent. It is the government. It's a national government. States notwithstanding, the people notwithstanding, you're all garbage. And yet, 
we've been lulled into going along with it because by golly next year we're gonna vote in someone even better we're so we're such we've been duped we're ignorant all right but i think that when i first walked in here that you were really getting to the root of the matter the erosion of uh private property when there's no respect for private property in in the sense that you can actually own property and it's and you're secure in it, we don't have that at all. Nobody's secure in their private property. Not, you have a a system of fluid laws, and uh, private property isn't viewed as uh, as it should be. That's for sure. It's viewed as um, as being fluid, also, just like the laws. Well, when they can say that, uh, you know, one of the colonists, their gripes against the king and parliament was, hey, it's a well-known fact. It's part of our culture. It's part of history that we're secure in our persons and property. You can't just barge into our cabin and demand to see things, which is what was going on during the uh, Prohibition Act. The uh, king gave different taxing authorities the right to kick down your door to find... No, it was the Sugar Axe. Okay, they gave him the right to kick down your door to find contraband. And the colonists were like, you can't do that. We have the right to be secure in our property. Now, one of the reasons that they were upset was because just about every colonist was involved in smuggling <laughs> at the time. Because the... Right, what, what, why would they care, Josh, if they didn't have something to hide? Right. Parliament had a 100% tax on molasses, the sugar act. Well, you could not survive in the colonies without sugar because you couldn't make rum. So one of the things, you couldn't buy rum, uh, sugar from the East Dutch, <laughs> the East Dutch company, which had fantastic sugar, molasses, cheap. The Dutch were the greatest at having cheap products because they were the best merchants. You couldn't buy from the French. You had to buy from the... Uh, the uh, West Indian Company, which was owned by the British government. Well, it wasn't owned by them, but the king's buddy owned the company. So he forced, so there's a 100% tariff on it. Well, the, the king was pretty busy fighting wars at the time, so he wasn't really worried about his sugar act. The people weren't paying the tax. They are just like, woohoo, they were smuggling it. Hancock was one of the greatest smugglers. You know, the guy that writes his name big, signed his John Hancock on there? He was a smuggler. That's how he made his money, was smuggling items under the nose of the British Navy. He was good. So what Parliament did was they had said, you know, this isn't working really good. These guys are smuggling, but we need to make some cash money off of them. So what we're going to do is, instead of having this 100% tariff, this 100% tax, we'll drop it to 2%, but we're going to enforce it. And we give our tax collectors the right to beat down your door and search for it. That's when the colonists rose up and said, no, you may not. Now, Parliament said, we're giving you a deal. I mean, this really is, you can read the writings that went back and forth. And Parliament was like, what in the world? We just cut 98% of the tax off. The colonists said, yeah, but before, actually before it was a trade tax. Mm -hmm. Now it was a direct tax. And the colonists said, yes, but you may not. And it was voluntary in the sense that you could choose to go and participate in it or not. Or smuggle. Exactly. But the colonists said, well, wait a minute. This is taxation without representation. Parliament's argument was, well, it's 98% cheaper, which is what our government, well, we're giving you a deal. Yeah, but do you have the authority to do such a thing in the first place? We're letting you keep half of your wealth. Our income tax is only around 50% when it comes down to it. What's your problem? Roosevelt wanted 100% after $25,000. we are giving you a deal. Yeah, but do you have the authority to do so? I Two points of order, Mr. Bennett, if I may. Point of order. Uh, you, you've made a reference to... It's like Robert's Rules. Going on. I just want to make sure that we're, okay. that we're keeping everything on the up and up here so that people can go and double check what it is that you're saying. They can triple check. You have made several references... I double dog dare them. ...to uh, people saying basically to the uh, government that the you do not have the right to come into my home. And then what I'm... The phrase that pops into my head is, a man's home is his castle. Yes. Where does that come from? English. What was his name? Oh. I thought that was German. No, it was an English uh, parliamentarian. That, that, that phrase, I mean, that has a, a strong philosophical grounding. 
No, that, it that absolutely for, had in, in in common law. Yeah, part of that was with, I believe, part of that had to do with the colonists. I mean, you had guys like Edmund Burke over there in England that was totally for the colonists. He was a member of par- British Parliament. He wasn't against them seceding from the British government. But he actually stood up for the colonists and said, what are you guys doing? He was like the Ron Paul at the time, you know. He was like, what are you guys doing? They're absolutely correct in what they're saying. If I was an American, I would be fighting you also. You have to remember the first year that the colonists fought actually took up arms against the British government. It wasn't for secession. They were fighting for their British rights, rights of British citizens, the rights of the Englishmen. The other, the, but, other point, the other point of order I wanted good. to bring up here is that you were talking about uh, smuggling with the colonists. That's actually, I've been reading Conceived in Liberty, finally, <gasps> around to that. Sweet. I downloaded that on my phone. Nice. Very cool here, a little PDF file, which is not so little, it's pretty huge. <laughs> it's like uh, 9,000 you know, pages. It's amazing. Uh, it took up like all the memory on my phone, except for the fact that this is a smartphone and it has like unlimited memory. Anyway, point is this, in Conceived in Liberty, it points out that the issue of smuggling goes back hundreds of years in the English law because of the the priority and the preference that was given to certain traders. Right. To, uh, only you may... Uh, There's monopolies. Only you may sell the wool Government to, to Flanders. Only you may merchant in and Government textile. monopolies cause scarcity, Josh. I thought you already went over that. That way the <laughs> market goes up. That's <laughs> right. Pricing goes up that way. It works. <laughs> so you've got the, this foundation of people. I mean, this is for hundreds of years. Yeah, whatever the government's going to do, that's fine. We're going to go ahead and do, take care of business our own way. And it is when people smuggle that you really see the economies take off. Right, and if people don't understand what smuggling is, it's basically like today what the government calls it is the black market. And basically all it is is when the government's not getting their fair share. That's anything that the, when the government's not getting their fair share, that's the black market. That's like if you, smuggling. If you show up yeah, over Josh, at... but that's uh, not right because you're not paying your fair share. Right. It's like if you show up over there I at Pioneer to. Park to buy <laughs> vegetables out of somebody's trunk. Right. That would be the black market basically. And they'll get around to it. Well, I you're mean, not going to... I mean, the, they have agendas uh, to keep us from doing stuff like that. We ought to hit the phones, but I, just two quick well, facts we'll here. Just wrap up this hour. It's only you know that uh, minutes left. for every dollar that the government collects in taxes, it costs them a dollar sixty-seven. For every dollar that goes, every dollar that actually hits a welfare recipient, it costs five dollars to get that dollar to them. In the uh, New York school district. They, I don't know how many thousands of kids they have, but they have a, th- a lot of thousands of kids. There is 27,000 bureaucratic administrators for that school district. The Catholic school district in the st- city of New York City, they have one-sixth of the people, which is quite a bit. No, no, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. Someone's going to look that up. No, I'm wrong. They have 6,000 bureaucratic administrators for the school district of New York City. The Catholic school has one-sixth of the children that go to school go to the Catholic school. So that's got to be thousands of kids also. It is thousands. They have a total of 26 administrators. How many is there? In I'm, I'm, I'm 6,000. I'm hearing the sound. Kind of sounds like a train just going... Full yeah. steam. That was just a big, that was a jump off of what we were talking about, but it's just a few facts here going back to bureaucracy. The, it's what, the same thing. Right, it's the state. The state, I mean, when you ask the state, it goes back to the um, limited government. When you ask the government to limit itself, How? who are you going to limit when you have 700,000 people in involved, well, this was like three or four years ago, involved in collecting taxes? That's 700,000 jobs. So which one of those people are you going to throw out of a job? How many hundreds of thousands of people are involved in the Department of Education? Are you going to throw them all out of a job? They'll vote themselves out of a job, Josh, because they <laughs> vote principal. Aha. <Uh-huh. laughs> yeah. So basically, the point is, when you argue for a limited government, you're arguing a fallacy. It may not happen. It cannot happen. It will not happen. 
It is against the laws of nature itself. Josh, the American experiment proves that limited government's possible. We had limited government. Aaron, you need you keep talking to the mic that way. You need to talk well, to Well, that's it, because I'm right trying to here. talk to Josh. I don't really like talking then to people. Then turn the microphone. <laughs> turn. All right. Well, yeah, let's take one. There's 458 talk is the number. I wonder if anybody is still on hold. I wouldn't be. All right. Hey, we got we got a live one. Good morning. Who's this? This is Sally. How are you this morning? Good. Good. Um, I looked up the, the, the quote, uh, man's home is his castle, and it gave the credit to Sir Edward Coke. However, it said it was an old English proverb. So it's something that was handed down, and he just happened to use it at the right time and was given the credit. And Coke was during, I think he was around the 1680s. Yeah, something. they said he used it in a, in a, in a treatise, treatise uh-huh. uh, in 1628. 20s. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So, anyway, okay. Yeah, I appreciate Thank that. Thank you very much. Yeah. I appreciate that. You know, this is one of the things about the information age now. We've got every <clears throat> everybody can be a fact checker, and they should be, because how often, holy smokes, do you do you believe what you hear from the government, Aaron? I do. Yes. <laughs> when, 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 they, when they issue an official statement about anything, about Benghazi, about... I do. The... I drone in. I mean, I tune in. Well, I, I, anything. Speaking of drones, aren't they bringing some drones right here? It was in the newspaper, like six of them or something. Sweet. Yeah. Target practice. <laughs> Did you just? <laughs> the. Uh, you know, we're conservatives. We'll never always believe the government is when it comes to involves defense. Anything that they say that we need in the de- in defense, they say, "Yep, just give it to them." Blank check. If the military says, oh, we're going to die if we get $3 billion taken away from us. Yep, give them eight, whatever they want. Give them $8 billion. Give them 8 They need 3 give them 20 What's up with that? Are you unpatriotic? You want to die. Do you want to die? And yet, so what they're using is your patriotism against you, basically, because even though we had a president named, and he was also a five-star general, Eisenhower, told us that the country basically was being run by a military-industrial complex. And yet conservatives, neocons mostly, not actual liberal conservatives, (laughs) classical conservatives, they refused to hear that. Well, no, they need the money. When we had John F. Kennedy said the same thing, he's like, all of a sudden came out and said, well, this country's being run by a freaking military-industrial complex. Close your ears. Mm. When <coughs> Kennedy actually gets assassinated by his own government, and we just close our eyes and our ears, mm, let me to government, we're uh, going to vote in the right guy. Listen to Kennedy's inauguration speech, and then it becomes very clear why he didn't live very long. We, sorry about that. But we, we totally close our eyes and plug our ears, and we say, limited government, we got to get the right guy in. we got to do it. We can do it. Well, and you look at even... 2014, buddy. Look at even 16. like... 16. Whatever. I'm voting for Hillary. Two weeks after the election, you had all these talking heads who were telling us how we needed to go out there and vote for Romney. You needed to go out there. We needed to do this. Uh, and Or the world's going to end. Now, what was it? Like two weeks later, their entire focus, once again, is on the next election. Um, and all Steve, <laughs> did you miss the fact that Romney didn't get voted in? Right, so we got to Right, it's totally keep it going. the election was totally irrelevant because Obama won. It was irrelevant? Yes. Maybe well, Obama. it goes back that's the Well, now we got to wait four more years. That's the mantra God. to keep us to keep us sullied, to keep us in our little holes, to make us not speak out. It's because ah, don't you revolt, don't you get mad. You can vote in four more years. Now, 160 years later, we're going to be going, now, hold on, hold on, don't get upset. You can vote in four more years. Uh, you look at all the people that I know personally, a lot of them good people, that are I don't believe basically that. acting like sheep right now. They talk the talk about, for instance, on the gun issue. Well, if he passes a law against guns, I'm not going to obey it. And you know what? I, th- I think BS, because right now you're obeying all of the other laws that have restricted your gun ownership or your freedom of speech or your, I mean, what, does anybody remember the Fourth Amendment? 
Who? That, that's the one that says that you're supposed to be securing your persons and papers? He was voted right? out a long time ago. Uh, and, and yet we just keep telling, oh, no, no, you need, you need to respect the cops. They're just doing their job. Go ahead and give yeah, them your papers. Go ahead and show them their papers. Make sure you carry the right papers in the first place so that you're legal. Yeah. Steve, once again, <laughs> you're alluding to the fact that you have to hide something. What do you have to hide? Yeah, Steve. That is the argument the KGB used. <laughs> They used that argument. Look it up. And who did they... Wow, you act like they did so many... Who did President things. Roosevelt admire more than any other world leader? Stalin. Stalin. <laughs> yeah, he got... It's a fact. He wrote it. He loved Stalin. Because he killed like 50 million people. The guy no, was no, no, bad no. in the bone. I don't think he, had, he admired him because he killed people. He admired him because he got the job done. Yeah. Whatever it Whatever took. Whatever it took. Right. He admired, he admired him, him because, because he got away with it. He took a... Russian community and brought it together. Now, he had to kill everyone that didn't want to be a part of it. Of course, when there's no more opposition, everyone's on the same page. Is America so much different? I don't know. No? Is any human different? Is any government different? Take a mortal man, put him in control. Watch him become a god. Watch people heads roll. That's my favorite part. (laughs) Come on, rock it. You've got it on the Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. Hour 2 is on the way right after the Fox News. You can join us in the chat room, KFAR660.com, or listen on your smartphone with the free tune-in radio app. All right, welcome to Hour 2. This is Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. It's local talk radio, 660 on your AM dial. But we are also streaming live online at KFAR660.com and on your smartphone with the free TuneIn radio app. Joining us in the studio from Far North Tactical, we have Aaron Bennett. And from Bighorn Enterprises, we have Josh Not Bennett. Not coming across here, bro. Not can, coming across online. Let me uh, see if your brother are messed with your cord oh, over there. Jeez. Did he mess with your cord? Yeah. All right. There you go. All right. What do you want to do from now? We re, we've been talking about uh, property rights. We've been talking about the basically the where property comes from. And I want to have a revolution. Did we really talk about where property comes from? I didn't really hear yeah, that. Yeah, we talked about how it comes from your labor. Basically, if you if you go out and you work, you're exchanging part of your life. For whatever it is you get in return, if if it's a piece of silver or whether it's a piece of land or if it's a side of moose, because you went out and helped somebody gut it, that property is yours by fact of your life in exchange for whatever it is you got. You know, when I hear those founding father quotes kids do on that thing, just want to just like throw my headphones off and go home. So far gone. Yeah, it really is. That's disgusting. We just got to get back to what it was, Josh. You know, they weren't trying to get back to what it was. That's interesting. They were trying to push on. Well, I mean, the whole point was to uh, get their rights under the English government right. as English subjects. Which was pretty good. So when they won the war, why didn't they um, get back to what it was? Well, technically they thought they were sort of kind of when they... That's why they put it on a piece of paper because they thought that the English Constitution was too arbitrary because it wasn't written down. So they thought, well, if we write it down, then most people will look at that and say, well, it's right here on paper. How can we argue with it? That's what they put Right, that down. way posterity can grab their paper and wave it in the government's face. Mm-hmm. Use it to block the blows that... It works. From the... Uh, the bullets. Yeah, if it I would work if we would get back to it. When I got body armor, I bought body armor and I just put, I got a plate carrier. I just put a copy of the Constitution in the front. I'm like, bang, go ahead, fire away. Well, I'm sure that worked. It'll block bullets. <laughs> Let's take the call. Four five eight talk is the number. <coughs> Good morning, call. Are you still there? This I is Patriots talk. Lament. How about you? Good morning. Hey, who is this? Cecily. Good morning, Cecily. What's on your mind? Oh, quite a few things. Like the, it was, it's just in the emotional level. It's not. It breaks my heart to, to pay my taxes for them to continue to rob the people that they don't care to have, continue to live in their town over there in Fairbanks. And and then I was trying to be a little bit higher in the mind and said, well, I shouldn't assign malice to 
what is really stupidity. And uh, and my brother who was, was proud and always had something for somebody, you know, has should and deserves restitution for having all of the things that the mayor decided should be stolen from him because he didn't value it as much as say our entire family who you know he reported that they crushed my my mom's belongings and she had just just passed away the year before and just to, just anyway they destroyed a man who was duped into to um fighting for his country that turned on him and and um in his you know in his old age and that that uh, that that the mayor is so consumed with garbage or other people's garbage or you know what 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 it's just anyway that's the emotional part of it but then no it's called tyranny Cecily it's called uh, tyranny tyranny yeah he claims the right to lord himself over anyone's property not just that he says particular that he, individual yeah he has the right to tell you what you can and cannot do with your own property what you can and cannot have on your property what you can and cannot whatever if the, he if so the much borough gold or, if the borough what? can force you to uh, pay tribute to live on your own land, and they obviously claim the right over your land. Yeah, None it's not of us, because he has the goal, it's because he has the state power. He can call the police up and they'll go shoot you in the head. Right. Ultimately, the end state is if you resist, then they reserve the right to kill you. Because they own you and your property. I did meet the one man who did not um, join in, in in robbing my brother. And and I, I apologize that I can't remember his name because I it was at a at a at a uh, dance, and I danced and danced, and it was great, and and the music was loud enough so that I lost my voice and my hearing. <laughs> so anyway, but but he was a, a gentleman, and he didn't, and he voiced that or yelled at the top of his lungs into my ear <laughs> that it, that he wasn't did he was. Did there. he work for government? Yes, he did. So he gets paid by money that's been appropriated from everybody else's property, but he didn't participate in any theft. He no, he did not participate in the actual theft of my brother's property, even though he was invited to. Sure, he be participated paid. in a much more sanctioned theft, one that uh, we all get along with because it's property it's taxes spread out uh, across everybody. It's still theft, and he it's, still participates. And, and keep he in still mind. reserves the right to watch people get shot for not paying for his. Uh, living yeah we That's don't true. give people a pass anyone yeah. well we keep must pay for the 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 high you know the people that are better than us you know we gotta we gotta pay tribute to to our our better well, the only way you can become better though is if you participate in the competition of government yeah. there are some good guys in the wormach <laughs> you know, yeah, i've been invited to marry yeah some schindler he was a pretty good guy he saved a few of them yeah, for point, benefit. Point you know? of order. Point of order here. Oh. And, uh, just uh, in terms of we what sure have a lot of points of order. What today. Cecily is talking about is the city of Fairbanks versus what the Bennett brothers have been talking about, the borough. However, the city of Fairbanks does have taxing authority, and in fact, taxes more than the borough does, so that people who live in the city, inside the city limits of the city of Fairbanks, pay the highest tax in all tax. in all of Alaska. I like Josh's point that uh, the federal government taxes us, and the state taxes us, and the borough taxes us, and all of them claim that it's for our protection, but none of them protect us from each other. Yeah, and if you ever want to figure out who has the most power, look at who collects the most taxes. The federal government? Oh, bingo! So if the state, if the borough won't protect us from the state, and the state won't protect us from the Fed, then why don't we just have the Fed so we can quit getting triple tax? Come on. I agree. All right. Thanks, Cecily. Appreciate the call. I really like your analogy on that, Josh. Why are we getting triple taxed? I don't know. Because we need to be triple protected. I like to be triple protected. I, feel it's all I like to double down on my protection. It's funny. I feel triply unsafe. <laughs> I'm never... You know, I'm never... Okay. For some reason, I worry a whole lot more about having a goon with a badge break down my door than just a regular That's because you have stuff to hide, Josh. Other people don't feel that way. Oh. People that aren't doing bad things are not scared of government. 
Alexander Solzhenitsyn. You act like the laws change daily on what's bad. Point. <laughs> True. I know. I, I needed to stop that where people just make arbitrary decisions and laws of whoever and whatever they want. And... Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Karen. <laughs> I forgot. This is America. America. <laughs> Oops, that's the wrong one. America. All right, you ready to take yeah. another call? 458 Talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Uh, hello? Hello, who is this? Gerald. Gerald, what's on your mind? How are you doing today, Gerald? Good. Uh, is this the ruling elite of Patriots of Man? <laughs> That's an interesting <laughs> sorry, question. Sorry. Sorry. We okay, definitely I, do I'm, not wish to rule, nor do we consider ourselves elitist. We would just I'm sorry. Like I, I'm to, just teasing you. I like I you know. guys. I like teasing you. All right, so... No, I appreciate uh, you calling in. It's been good stuff. All right, I'd like to say something and then make a comment. Go for it. Okay, Josh, I left something for you at Patriots for Matt, and there was a note in it saying I needed it back. I got it. Can, can you see that I get it back? Because i I, I got to have that picture on the cover. Okay, you want it today? I love that picture. Okay, so here's my comment, if I may. Go ahead. Okay, I think maybe the Catholic school administrators probably save money by not having someone check for pedophiles, and that was our government who busted them for that. And Tennyson said that... Um, with the law, civilized life is scarcely manageable. Without the law, it's impossible. John Stuart Mill said, uh, it's better to be subject to one large bird of prey than innumerable lesser harpies. And my question is, is not your concept there should be fewer rules in our society also a rule that you want to impose upon everyone else? And I'm not being sophistic. No, that's Thanks. fine. I, I got gotcha. you. But... Um when you talk about laws and rules and stuff like that, they were not talking about an arbitrary law, quote-unquote law, where any old person who got voted in could pass any old law that he decided was right and correct for that time, because that is not law. That's political law, they call it, or positive law, which basically is, today I decide this, somebody else gets in, well, today I don't like that, I want this. That's not law. Law stands the test of time. The law that law stands can't the test... Law fluid. Right. Fluidity, fluidity in law is unjust. It's not justice at all. When you have that kind of law, you basically have, well, but most of it is just for revenue gathering, but the actual law and correct law, we, when we say less rules and blah, blah, and we want to force this and that, we don't want to force anything. Our idea of the law is, to, is not forcing anyone to do anything, but keeping people... You do whatever you say you will do, which is contractual law, and you don't harm your neighbor. That's it. That's right. the basis I, of our law. There, if there's no unquote. victim, there's no crime. If there's no victim, there's no crime. You don't hurt someone, you didn't do anything wrong. There's no arbitrary state that says, well, you hurt me because I made this baloney. Right. It's, the state makes itself a victim in everything. And they decides make a law and, and set themselves as, up as a victim. So if you violate that law, you victimize them, and they claim the right to be compensated. And when you bring up the fact that the state supposedly um, broke up this pedophilia that happened in the Catholic Church and schools and stuff, sure. But at the same time, we can probably Google and find thousands of the same same situations that happen in public schools that are created by the state. I mean, you're not going to get rid of evil, but having evil to check evil doesn't work. Right, you got to change the accountability. Well, and something that the caller said about how you want to enforce a rule of no rules, it, it basically doesn't that infringe on other people's right to be ruled, is kind of what he was saying. Uh, it, that you, you want fewer rules, right, Josh? I want none. Okay. There are some people out there who want rules in their life. There's nothing that's not... You mean like the new one where they just decided that retard is no longer a word? Well, yeah, exactly. You Which know is kind of nice because now it's no longer politically incorrect to say retarded because it's not even a word. Now it's a crime. Oh, it is? I thought they just made it no longer a word. That they retarded, struck, retarded, they, retarded, retarded. They retarded. struck it from all of the state legislation. They struck, they struck that word from all... It's as if that word never existed in the law... In the state of Alaska. And thou, and thus it shall be. So like shall the, it be written, so shall it be done. But there's, yet, nothing, there's nothing to stop you. If you want to live a life full of rigid rules for yourself, go right ahead. Nothing's going to stop I'm not going to nah, try to stop you. but that's no fun. we got to force it on other people. Yeah, if someone wants someone to be their god and arbitrary and arbitrarily tell them what they can and cannot do, I'm fine with that. There Don't are, tell me what to do. There are plenty of churches that offer that. Yes, there <laughs> are. There are exactly. Go live under that. But we're not, we don't advocate ruling over anyone. 
our law is the perfect law. You love your neighbor as yourself. That was funny, Steve. That's it. <laughs> you ready to take another call? Yeah. 458 Talk, the number. Good morning. And this is Patriots Lament. Who's this? Hello, uh, uh, Frank. Frank, go ahead. Uh, are you guys familiar with John Dewey, the pragmatist and uh, the founder of modern educational system? Yes. Okay. Well, I'm make a, very I'm gonna, well, Unfortunately, right. Uh, one of his quotes is, independence and self-reliance is counterproductive to the collective society. And right now, we're in the midst, I'd say the final stages of a bloodless coup d'etat of our country. You know, that's into this march to state. I wouldn't know march. if I would say bloodless. That, no, that's a really good point. You know, what we have today is basically the same thing as what happened during the French Revolution, where they said basically what they set up is what we've turned into. And the other thing where you pointed out the civilization, that's all we hear now. Well, it's the, for the good of the community, the good of the community, the good of the community, which all that ever does is strengthens the state and destroys the individual. We weren't we are not a country of people that were you know I don't wake up and think about necessarily the good of the community. I think about the good of Josh and the good of my family and the good of my brothers, which is perfectly normal and actually you know what? It's perfectly fine. That is individual liberty. And when everyone actually does have individual liberty, the community is better off. What these people try to push off on us like, wow, it may it may uh it may, you know, harm your individual rights, but it's good for everyone as a collective. Well, no, it's not. If it harms an individual, if it harms one of us, it harms the community. Because if one person can't be free, then neither shall the other person. And it goes down and down. But if we're all free, that is actually what helps community. That's what helps society. When we're free to have, right, we well, engage in our own labor, keep our own property. You take away the accountability. Well, well at least we don't have a guillotine yet. <laughs> yet. yet yet no I don't think they're going to use you, those you let, are very fun you let the Drone two, strikes you let the two cool. political sides go far enough the end state would be the guillotine yeah. on each other so yeah I'm glad you brought Democrats, that up Democrats kill the Republicans get her done and that's exactly what the public schools teach now and I mean from 5 to 18 or whatever you get taught for the good of the community. You get taught that the government is there to protect you for the good of in all. In all principle and all morals are For relative. the good of the cause. Right. right. We've been we've been channeled down by my manipulation for generations now. And we think ourselves free thinkers, but we are not. Mm -hmm. Until they, they change what is good and proper into ugliness and evil. And there's no two ways about it. It's like this homosexual marriage. Uh, it undermines, this is the underpinning, our family is, is a, the binding force of our whole society. And it goes against every natural law of life. It Take does. Take that away and we're dead meat. No, it, it does, but we're trapped in the wrong argument. The argument isn't whether or not you should have or whether homosexual marriage is proper. The argument should what be gives the right why to does government the state, to tell anybody who can get married. Why does the state a third party to a marriage? Why should the state tell you who you can and can't marry? Why does the state have the right to say that you to marry a woman have to have a license to do so? Um, um, your, 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 the country you would have would be total anarchy. That would and be great. And it goes against our history and traditions. No, it doesn't. It does so. I mean, what is our, we, in other words, homosexual marriage was always the standard of the land. Well, a homosexual nation would cease to exist because it cannot propagate. No, that's, that's absolutely true. But what you're talking absolutely about is, true. what you're talking about is the state legitimizing it. Take the state out of the equation and then who cares what those guys do? Do you want to kill uh, them? When, uh, when Obama said, uh, "No, do you want to no, kill?" That's, that's do you a want legitimate to, question. Do you want? Do you, want do you to wish them? to eradicate homosexuals from America? Excuse me. Do you wish to no, eradicate? No, I would say they can do anything they want within the confines of their home. Exactly. I am, uh, that's their business. Right. Exactly. What I'm saying is that when we argue that the state shouldn't. Um, codify it into law that this is a correct thing to do, that is correct. But that shouldn't be the argument. The argument should be, for us as free individuals, the state shouldn't be involved in marriage whatsoever. The state shouldn't be giving license or privilege to marriage. 
It's none of their business. That's between you, God, and your spouse. So if you take that argument away, that's what we're trying. We're not for, quote unquote, homosexual marriage. But we're also not for the state being a part of marriage at all. If you take that away from the state, right, and you kind you of win. you kind the of homosexual alluded that marriage. if we took the state out of it, then everybody would be homosexual. It's the same argument for if we got rid of the monopoly of the use of force that the state has, we would all kill each other. It's right, we just well, the same Obama, argument. Go ahead. Do you remember Obama said it when one of his campaign, one one of those debates years ago? that uh, some obscure passage in Romans. Well, I challenge every one of your listeners, read the first chapter of Romans, and read, then make up your mind. Read the whole and book. And if you take away the Bible, look at it from an evolutionary point of view. Homosexuality is no more than a degenerate mutation, because it cannot propagate. A genetic dead end. No, we, we the don't... The society on that is wrong. We don't disagree. What we're saying is that the argument that the conservatives are making against it is incorrect because you're asking the state to stop something that it should have no business being involved in in the first place. If you take away the state's right to arbitrarily decide who can and can't marry, you take that out of the state's hands, you don't have to worry about gay marriage anymore because the state's not going to legitimize it. If I the don't state see how can't you can give, that. you take, you got to take... How are you going to accomplish... How are you accomplishing it with the state? How are you going to accomplish it with the state? The state's the problem. Allowing well, them to decide who can be married. I mean, right now, if you don't get a marriage license, they say, well, you're not married. Why? Well, because I'm the arbitrator. So now, when we let them do that, we've also given them the right to decide who can and can't marry who. And if they have the right to decide that, don't they also then also have the right to go back and revoke all marriage licenses? Well, sure, if they were the ones that granted it. I mean, think about it. Would. If the state is the one who has the ultimate power to decide who can or cannot get married, then you're saying, yes, state, you have permission to tell me I can no longer be married to my wife. Or to tell me what to do in my marriage. Exactly. And if well, you I don't procreate anyway. I that much. <laughs> What's I that? really don't. I mean, I don't have that much argument with you guys other than uh, we're going down rabbit trails when the fundamental building blocks of our any decent society is being destroyed, like I talked about John Dewey. Uh, they have mind-manipulated so many people, and they don't realize that they think themselves so free, and they're being hazed down this path. Right, but we should just go with your analogy there and let them, let them do what they want to do because they can't procreate anyway, and they'll get rid of themselves. No, well, the, the, uh, what, what we're saying is, just I'll slow it down and just repeat it one more time. The problem is that we've given the state the authority... We, as in the people, we've let them, we've allowed them to create this thing called a marriage license. And originally a marriage license was created for people so that blacks could not marry whites. That's it. That is the original intent of a marriage license because they didn't want races mixing together. So they got certain white people to go along with it, you know, and they're like, oh, yeah, we don't want that. That's ridiculous. So now we have a marriage license on everything. But when we did that, we gave up our God-given right to marry whom we wish to marry. And when and that gave the state the right to decide, well, now we decided that these people shall be married also. The point is we have to take back, we have to take away their supposed authority to decide who can marry who. And we just celebrated Valentine's Day. I mean, you think about who was driving, Saint, who was Saint Valentine was, is that he was a man, he was a priest who rebelled against his Roman emperor. Yeah. The, the emperor said, basically, he forbade marriage. He took it one step farther and said, you know what, I don't want anybody married because married men do not make as good as soldiers as single men do. Therefore, there will be no marriage. And Valentine, believing deeply in his heart that God is the one who sanctions marriage, not an emperor continued to marry people. Are you trying to say you want black and white people to marry, Steve? Gosh. I don't care who gets married. If it's between them and God, it's not my business any more than it's their business. Yeah, to the caller, we're not arguing your point per se that they should be whatever. We're arguing that the way we're going about it is wrong. Just like the uh, parental acts that they want to pass. 458 Talk is the number. Our lines are full. Keep trying. We'll try to get some more calls in. You've got it done. Patriots Lament on KFAR Local Talk Radio. This is KFAR. Fox News is now. Let freedom ring. 
Or God Save the King. Which is it? Freedom Ring. Right. Welcome yeah. back to Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. It's local talk radio, but we are streaming live around the world at KFAR660.com. Joining us in the studio, as always, from Bighorn Enterprises, we have Josh Benedan from the place formerly known as Far North Tactical. Come on. we got got uh, Aaron Bennett up in here today as well. And there's a silent guest. Silent partner, dude. Sitting there in the back, just kind of watching. Would you like to say Hello. anything? Hello. Wow. It's Andy Long. Andy, good day. Oh, Andy. great. Right Now down. you've been identified to all of our special listeners in the government today, and I do mean special. We identify everyone just so we don't go alone. Just like right. the exactly. special Olympics. <laughs> all right. Aaron, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I wanted to point out that really the argument for or against, or the argument to involve government in marriage uh, via I mean, using homosexuality as your reason to do it, isn't that the exact same argument that they use to, like Josh was saying, to institute it in the first place to keep black people from marrying white people? The same fundamental argument for it to be is still there, regardless of what moral stance you're taking. I mean, you can't say one's better than the other because you feel morally one's better than the other. Yeah, and, and if we're going to do it, why don't we just uh, make no races be able to marry or whatever we want to do? Arbitrarily. Or just say that only pe- people can only marry dogs or whatever it is we want to do. It, it, how does it make any difference? Well, and the other thing, too, that I... The conservative movement or the conservatives... Um, We'll say the Republican Party, Conservative Party, they've used this uh, marriage thing to keep power, right? Because what is government so good at doing? They point out all the horrible things that they can only save you from. So you have the Conservative Party saying, "Keep us in power, keep us in power, we'll save you from the homosexuals," <laughs> and then they say, "Keep us in power, keep us in power, we'll end abortion." <laughs> that worked out great. At the top of the hour, what is it? Keep us in power, keep us in power. We'll save you from the Iranians because they're going to build a nuclear weapon even though... Korea just tested a nuke, by the way, come on. Yeah, keep us in power, keep us in power because Korea's going to nuke us at any moment. Obama won't protect us from Korea. Gosh. Right. Even though, right. Okay, because these guys might get a nuclear weapon. We have how many thousands? About 30,000 in our... Uh, continental ballistic thousands of nuclear missiles that can destroy the earth how many times over we're the only ones that have ever used our trident subs they have 24 known ones and each one has uh 20 10 uh, i don't know why you're so concerned about nuclear weapons i mean we killed more people in the firebombing of dresden than we did in either one of the nuclear blasts 24 onboard nukes i thought and they come out go to the stratosphere and break into 12 individuals i thought it was 10 individuals well they have a a few rabbit trail (laughs) <laughs> no, it's facts. We don't we, want anyone to say, hey, you guys are wrong. They only got three, seven new Johnny. And then, yeah, Dresden, good point. Where the great and mighty United States killed civilians. Like, What's nobody's business. That? Josh, what did they have to hide? That's true. It's nothing, actually, because their buildings were... After there was done, there was nothing there. <laughs> there was nothing to hide anymore. Right, but... See, if they would have resisted that, then they obviously had something to hide. Much more people died in the firebombing at Tokyo than did Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Much more. Yeah, but they were all probably hiding something, too. Well, that was the greatest generation. We were morally right and correct in our fight for democracy to spread amongst the world. Mm, okay, let's. we better... We're going to get people here. 458 Talk is the number. Good morning, Colin. You're still there? Yeah, this is Randy. Good morning, What's Randy. What's up, Randy? I was just wondering, uh, did you get that tape of your November 17th show that I sent you last month? Yes, sir. We did. Oh, we posted it, it oh, to, the, uh, to the website, too. Many thanks. Oh, okay, good. I just didn't know if I should send you another one. But that's good. Um, on your subject of the state, um, I agree with much of what you say. It's very valid. Very interesting, by the way. Um, but, you know, just I just thought I'd say that my focus on who's bad or what's bad is is really the people, the electorate. I consider the state just a tool, and granted it is flawed, but I consider it more of a reflection of the people when it's kind of a democratically laid uh, uh, election. But Randy, hang on. Isn't that what we say the problem is, is that everybody uses it for their tool? We recognize that it's a tool. It's a yeah. tool of force on your neighbor. Right. And and regardless of your you feeling that you you have the most morally right reason to use force, it still doesn't uh, change the fact that force is involved. So fundamentally, it's evil. Uh, yeah, there's there's a 
the bad side of it, the dark side of it. I, there, I, there's only one side of it. It's the use it's of force. It's all bad side of it. There's it no, is, I mean, right. is there? there is no good side of any of it. Well, well, you can justify the use of force if you're the most morally right. True. It's basically what, where you're getting ready to go with that. Go for it. Go Before ahead. I'm doing. Let's do oh, it. Well, you know, we've had this discussion before, and I, and I know what your position is. You want no government and everything, but I, I think a little bit of government is necessary, particularly in a densely populated, so, far-flung so complex. So who, who should decide who should have the use of force used on them then, if, well, if, if we're going to use a little bit? Uh, all the people are get together. They make this tool. And the tool sometimes develops a mind of its own and goes totally bad. No, not sometimes. Wait, no, wait, wait. When does that happen? Does a hammer ever do that? Hammers can be can be bad because they're misused, but it's not really the hammer's fault. But you can pound your thumb accidentally due to misapplication of the tool. If, if the hammer, if the hammer by itself threatened to hit people, then it would be bad. I mean, we can't use the gun argument because the gun itself doesn't do anything. The, right, it's the people pointing the, the gun the, and pulling the, the state, trigger. The state, as an apparatus, on the other hand, can't even function without force. So to to equate it to the gun in the room isn't isn't really the right analogy. It is the gun in the room. Right, but it's the guy holding. <laughs> it's the use of force. Yeah, but I guess I guess my thought is that. I mean, you're using the argument that a gun can't kill people without people using it, so the gun itself isn't bad. But that's uh-huh. not the state, because the state at its core is the use of force. It's not it's not this um, um, inept object that just sits there, right? Yeah. Well, we haven't so you asked, can't use the gun argument. But, we, we didn't ask Randy exactly where he's coming from yeah, here. Yeah, go and for it, Randy. Randy, why, why is a little bit of government necessary? Well, in order... To to have the courts and the police, which I know you guys think that can all be done privately, and and I'm all, like I said before a long time ago, I'm all for developing, you know, a section of land, an island off Alaska, where we set up an anarchy situation and let let's go with it, see how it is. I'm I'm for moving in that direction and, and trying it out and experimenting with it. But I'm I for pers- sending all the statists off into that island and let them have it out. You know what? They all eventually would die. But but wait, he hasn't actually answered the question, Randy. You're you're justifying its existence with its existence, saying we need the government in order to justify the government's existence. In other words, you're saying in order to have the courts and to have the law enforcement. Well, why why? Well, because. Like I go back to my original thing, I think the foundational problem, the root of the problem, is a flawed people. The citizens are flawed, including me. And, and e- each person has a seed of evil and a seed of good. And some, in some people, the seed of evil has taken over. And so you have all these flawed people, and then these flawed people try to set up a government to try to make things a little better. And the government is flawed, but they muddle through. And sometimes can, the government... Can I ask you a question a, really quick? Uh, yeah. The, um, so... Basically, if you admit that everybody, every human being is fallen and flawed, which uh-huh. you just did, yeah, who should be able to lord over you? Well, uh, when we set up a government, you know, we try to limit it and, and allow the government to only do necessary, quote-unquote, good things, but it sometimes gets out of hand. But the main reason in a democratic kind of society that it gets out of hand is not because the government so much takes a mind of its own and, and just rips away from our control, but because the people are so flawed that they vote in this type of government, and the government becomes a reflection of the people, and the reason we're in the situation but, we're but at... But at, at the root, it doesn't matter who they vote in. There's still the use of force. Yeah, well, you're right. That, you're right. But that's the yeah. fundamental of the problem. Yeah, governmental is force. It doesn't matter right. who you vote in. That's you're right. u- having the use of force on somebody. And you're using, basically, a Thomas Hobbes... You're using the Hobbes, Hobbesian argument that we're all bad and we need someone to govern over us, blah, 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 but that's not necessarily true because especially if you take that to its logical end, you're saying that since we're all bad, we need bad people to govern over us because if we're all bad, then that, if that is your subject, if that's your preposition, then anyone that gets in the government is inherently bad. There is no good that you're putting in there. What you're saying is that, well, if I elect them, now they're going to be good. Right, really, or they the, will decide to stop me from my badness. If, if that's your analogy, then it would stand to reason that the less you limit government, the better it would be. The the proof in the pudding would be... I mean, you're proving our point, basically, by saying that we're all bad. Right, the the big, government you, itself... You, you would have to argue for a complete, engulfed, one-world government, in using that analogy. Well, you know, the people in Sicily, they're a little bit bad, too. And I think they just about had no government... But then the mafia dons took over because it filled a vacuum that was needed, and they guess went along with that, and then it bred and festered and be- became the Costa Nostra, and they 
invaded other places like the United States. Right, you're basically regurgitating the state's argument to defend itself of why it's needed, Randy. You're not giving any good arguments for anything except the state's regurgitation. The state's the one that comes out and says, if it wasn't for us, these things would happen. I say baloney. But he's also making the point, and he may not be intending to make the point, but he's making the point that there is no difference between people who call themselves government and people who are just blatantly out-and-out criminals. Mafia. People who come and take money away from you. How much theft is a, is good theft? Maybe just a little theft? But they're well, only taking a little bit. It's limited theft. As long as you're morally right, it's not a big deal. Well, uh, I think people need tools. I need an axe. I need a shovel. I need a power saw. I need a car. I mean, I don't have to. I can be naked and have nothing and just try to eat grass, get on my hands and knees and eat grass or something like that. But tool, but eventually my tools, and, and this has happened to me, my tools have injured me. I've been injured by my tools I, uh, because of mis- Randy, You're hang, talking hang about on. a tool that you can Randy, control, you're Randy. Talking about the, you're talking about tools and equating those tools in the production of goods. Government is a production of bads. Okay, government, <laughs> government, competes, government competes in the production of theft. Government competes in the production of the use of force. You can't equate... No, they don't compete. They have monopolies. They, exactly. Oh, I know they have monopolies, but look at our three-part system. They compete. Look at the borough competing with the state and the state competing with the Fed. It, it's it's a it's a production of bads that you're trying to getting ready to try and equate to a production of goods. You taking up and using your physical body to create labor to create original appropriation. Well, and and the, to get more to his there's point, no original though, appropriation Aaron, with government. And, and and Randy, feel free to jump in on this too. But I think what he's trying to say here is that the whole point <coughs> of creating government as a tool is so that he can has a tool to force people to do things that he wants them to do. Right. When you right, were but talking that's about a production of bads. That's all I wanted to point. When out. you have talking about your hammer and your saw and whatever that hurts you, the difference between government is that you're using that tool to hurt someone else. Well, look at the guillotine. Why did they make the guillotine? That's just a tool, right? You know how to kill what people. Is the it purpose helps people. Of the, what is the purpose of that tool? Chop people's heads off. Is, should the guillotine ever have been created? It was much more efficient. I think it was misused unless you used to chop cabbages in half or something like that. Then that'd be good. But right, but when what government, name the government that chops cabbages. Um. <clears throat> I don't know what government. Oh, I guess all governments chop. Really cabbage. Good old Peter <laughs> Cabbage. He got chopped. And John Cabbage. <laughs> <laughs> Scott's Cabbage. Betsy well, Cabbage. They all got chopped. Randy, we understand that you wish to have some sort of government and whatever, but we're just trying to point out that no matter what argument you come up for legit- legitimizing it, we will argue that you cannot legitimize it. It is all a use of force against your neighbor. That's all it comes down to. And you say, well, we have to have it, otherwise bad men will take over. Guess what? Bad men have taken over. They're called the state. All right. People use the, the, the your analogy as a, pro- a production of bad. So, like, they, they talk about free market. Look what the free market does. It, it produces uh, this competition for all these evil things. The free market doesn't promote the competition of bads. You, you can't have competition in, in theft and in things like that. Well, I just think uh, uh, we would we would have a less productive society if we did not have some government. I know you disagree with that. No, 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 no. Not only do I disagree, Randy, you're absolutely 100% wrong. What you just said is not valid. It's not correct. It's false. It's 100% wrong. Well, absolutely I, I wrong. Don't... It doesn't matter what you think about it. You're absolutely wrong. To have to say that with government we have more production is not factual. It's, it's not, not historical. Not born out in history. It Definitely it did not happen. Not factual. The reason that we had the Industrial Revolution was not because of government regulation. It was in spite of, of government regulation. The reason we have the wealth is not because of government rules, regulations, whatever. It's just despite the market is so powerful. In spite of all the hurdles that the government has put up on the market, we are still a prosperous people. It's an look invisible at what it's do- Look at what it's doing to China. Yeah, I agree with you. Government can easily go over the tipping point and become a, a it is contrary the tipping force point. to production. Since they use force uh, from the that. minute that they start, they went over the tipping point. I, I've said this a bunch of different times, but a tax-funded protection agency is a contradiction in terms. Well, right out the gate, you can't even make the argument for it. Well, it's I mean, steel. you you on this show, not you, but somebody, or the other guy that used to be there. I blame Josh. Uh, gave an example of an anarchical society as Somalia. And, and, and an anarchical society can exist 
it can function and muddle along, but you can't tell me that that's going to be the most productive society. We, the United States, by far became the most productive society because... In spite of? Yeah, in spite of our government, which later became too regulatory, but I do think that a minimum amount of government allowed people... What regulation propagated our freedom and helped the market go more... What what government what the, part of government gave us more the wealth? Tax. Uh, the, the the part of government that did that was the police and courts that defined property boundaries and property rights. No, that was that contract. was defined way before there was ever police courts or anything like that. Um, you're actually contradicting because what police and courts have done have taken away property. Yeah, they can go beyond a tipping point. No, right? not not not. They can. They have since day one. As soon as you had legislatures and courts, they've decided to take away property and freedom. What what is a tax, Randy? Except taking away somebody else's property. Yeah, yeah, and I and I agree that government is force, and I I like I've said before. But I, you like I, to use force. That's what I don't. I, enjoy Randy's saying force, that government he is has force, to use and force. it's to fine as long as he wants them to do. Right. Well, no, government. I'm, I'm going to hold you to this one. Pointing it somewhere else. Where did the government regulation or courts or anything uphold and give us more liberty than what we had before these courts and everything? Where did they produce? Where did government <laughs> produce more wealth in the market? It, it. I think it produced more wealth by allowing people. To be able to, to in, in a sense of security, to have a piece of land and know that those boundaries will be defended in court if need be. If somebody starts encroaching upon their land, they can take it to court. Then how do you uh, how do you that how do you a, answer the that wild, was a priority the that was before the court. wild wild west where we had settlers move out west and there was no government. Well, in, in certain like I say, anarchy can exist in in certain uh, when it's. Uh, uh, a low density, and you just stake out your corner markers and, and, and have your Winchester ready and everything in the Indian. Right, Randy. So where was property more threatened, in inner city New York or in Oregon on the Oregon Trail? Probably in inner city New York, That's which right. is why I think they needed a government. That's because to, they had to a gigantic. Property. They have a gigantic government in New York. It's like bigger than most countries. Well, I mean, and you, you still haven't answered the question of what. Where, I mean, you gave, I think, but thinking doesn't matter. Facts are the only things that we're interested in. Where did the government produce more wealth? Because it, they were there. Maybe in, there's in a law the or a ruling. I think they did it in the United States. Which ruling? Pardon? Which ruling? Which law, Randy? The law, the, the, the law that creates the courts to define and defend private property and... and uh, we, no, caught, that was defined chaos. before. That, that was, was defined was in common before. law, well before that, Randy. I mean, you're 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 grasping at straws because there's nothing to your argument except an emotional attachment to this antiquated notion that somehow people need somebody else to tell them what to do. While we Steve, do, we wouldn't have property rights if the government didn't give them to us. We do encourage <laughs> thinking, but we don't. I mean, it doesn't matter what one thinks about something if they're wrong. Look at specifically. Do you have property? Do you have property? Do I have yeah, property? property? Do oh, we have? Okay. What if somebody uh, 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 puts their fence uh, 15 feet into your line? Uh, don't you want to be able to take it to some court and say, get it back on? First, you talk to your neighbor. Yes. I had this very situation. Somebody Randy, there's nothing fence. wrong with your analogy except for the fact that you can only go to one arbitration. The government reserves the right to be the only arbitrator in that. They have a monopoly on the arbitration of law, including their own disputes. Yeah, there's a monopoly on the ultimate in arbitration. In fact, the, but the, that's defi a good thing. the definition of How a is state, that a good wow. thing when the government gets to arbitrarily decide its own decisions against itself? When you go and try to argue against the government, they're the ultimate arbitrator. How is that good? I, if I, I mean, your whole thing about limited government is out the window because you say, well, the government's the ultimate arbitrator, and if you want to go and say, well, you, you've uh, defied the Constitution, this is unconstitutional law, and you said that ultimately them having the ultimate arbitration and final say is good, well, then they say, well, no, this is constitutional. So how is that good? How well, is that protecting the citizen? Well, it's not good when you have bad Supreme Court justices and too many bad So people. your whole system relies on people being good. But you said good in the beginning that, that we get the right all of person us, in office. and you said in the beginning that all of us Mitt are Romney. evil, so <laughs> your <laughs> argument doesn't hold not even like a drop of water. Well, what I said is all of us have seeds of evil. Some of us have a little more good on us than bad, and that's what I'm hoping and praying on, that enough of the people that have... 51% good and Well, hope and pray in one hand and look at the last 300 years in the other. Good luck. Well, Randy, uh -huh. is it a seed of evil to wish violence on another person? No. Not unless it's Timothy McVeigh. It's okay to wish violence on him. Wait, wait, wait okay, all right. So <laughs> that's, no, let's, done.
you're just, just you're yeah. done with it. All right, Randy, thanks, thanks Randy. for the call. Four five eight talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Hello. Hey, who Hello. is this? It is Claudio. Claudio, what's on your mind? Thank you hey, for uh, calling. <laughs> Another radical. I know. Are you, you pro government? Your guys are ruining my Saturday work life. <laughs> No I production. Work without it to guys first, so. You sound foreign. I don't think your opinion matters. <laughs> are you brown? Hey. Are you brown? I don't think foreigners should be able to be allowed to be to, to marry American women. That's what I think. I, I don't know. Or know I, I get along with. The, oh, maybe because I I just my life in Gibraltar instead. <laughs> hey, here's. I think Randy would have a good point if he could show any government that. Doesn't go that over that tipping point, you know. United States have a government as good as, much as good as gas, and it's still a so flawed. And you know, there's no such a thing as a, you know, he's he's talking about the utopia. You know, the the government is always go too bad. That's the tendency, you know. Yeah, he it's, brought up um, Somalia, right? That Somalia is in an anarcho state right now. Do you know when uh, Somalia was worse off than what they are right now? No, I don't. When they had a government. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. You can't really judge. You can't look at Somalia. You can't look at Somalia and say, "Oh, there's your there's your bad example." They were worse off. With you have the to look though. at where they were at to where they are at. Not judge them by American standard or by comparing them to anyone else. You have to look at where they were uh, pre-government and post-government, and they are a lot better off. <laughs> what do they think that overnight when they got rid of their government they're going to be a world power? That's ridiculous. They don't want to be a world power. Well, and, and if you, you know, some people look at the violence in Somalia and they point to that as if somehow that is a, a justification for we need government. Look at the violence in Chicago. <laughs> look at the violence in Chicago. They've got the most restrictive gun laws in the world. And and how many how many children were killed this year in Chicago? There was another one just last week. Right? Uh, it's close to 500 and something, wasn't? It? Or over? You know, there's a lot. So, but I mean, the people act like, well, you guys are just like a utopian, <laughs> blah blah blah. We're not utopian at all. We no. understand that there's bad things and bad people. We I, just would like to even the board a little bit by taking away the bads that the government produces. Actually, I think I would define myself as a dystopian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The the. You know, government's always going bad. Like, you know, like the Bible says, the government came to rob, to kill, and to destroy. I mean, they don't say it's government, but look the fruits, and by your fruits you will know. And fruits of government is death, destruction, corruption. Well, we know who the government's master is because he tried to give it away once. Oh, snap! <laughs> Claudio, thank you so much for the call. It's always, yeah, a, thanks, man. it's always fun. 458 Talk is It's always good to get a Claudio call after a Randy call. <laughs> good morning, caller. Who's this? Yeah. Hello. Uh, this, is, this is Ray uh, Lester. Ray, go ahead. You guys were talking earlier about marriage and uh, the state. Well, marriage originally was a contract between two people. And it's uh, in, under anarchy. You know, how, how can you get a divorce under anarchy? Uh, the government is to protect the weak people, like, let's say, a woman in the case of a marriage. Uh, she would be at a disadvantage unless someone was there to protect her rights to separation of property. And uh, an, another issue, uh, you guys were talking, uh, I find myself in an uncomfortable position of defending Randy, but... Uh, he, well, he was correct well, in, if you, in, he was correct in the fact that uh, you guys mentioned Hobbes and our worst nature. Under anarchy, our worst nature would come to the uh, rise to the top. How do you know? How that? do you? How, how can you show show me that in historical proof? In fact, because I mean, just what you're saying is without this evil government that expropriates, steals, kills, destroys claims the authority to be the arbitrator in all decisions, including with itself, without that we would all kill each other. Right now, there are no police officers in this building, and I don't feel the need to kill Steve. I, well, Aaron does, but I'm starting to see his point. What, what, I, I believe that that is a fallacy that the government has made us believe, because we, most of us go to public schools, and they've told us, without us, you will turn into vile gangsters and kill each other. 
And yet history has proven the exact opposite. There have been many societies without, quote unquote, big governments. There is still governance. And we but you don't have to have this ginormous government. Speaking of governance and government, right now we are up against the hard end of the program. So please call back again next week. Love to continue the conversation with yeah, you. Yeah, we can talk some more about the the marriage thing and the arbitration of the property. Thing.